we've talked about these emerging diseases and they so much mimic other diseases. And so we can't just assume all the time that it's the same thing. And, and so that's, that's really what sapovirus was. It looked like a classic coccidiosis, looked like a classic rotavirus, but it wasn't. And so we had to look deeper. Swanet. Hello and welcome to the Swine It podcast show. I'm Dr. Tara Donovan, and I'd like to introduce our guest today, Dr. Tom Petznick. Tom is a swine veterinarian with Art Care um, based out of Omaha, Nebraska. Welcome to our show, Tom. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Good. Well, Dr. Petznick is a first time guest on our show, and I've known Tom for over 25 years. In fact, uh, when I first got out of vet school, I worked with Tom my first year for a large integrated production system. And thank goodness that Tom was uh, a, a young leader and mentor for me at that time and showed me kind of the ropes um, being a new swine vet um, living uh, in Oklahoma and being from Nebraska. So I appreciate that time we spent together long ago, Tom, and a great, great to have you on. So for our listeners, can you introduce yourself and just give us a little bit of background of how you got where you are today so we hear it from you? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a Nebraska kid also. I, I truly was born in South Dakota, but I grew up all my life in Nebraska, just like you. And, and so growing up, I lived on a small family farm. Uh, my dad worked during the day, but then we had the animals to care for at night. And, and so I really developed a love of agriculture, but interestingly, I didn't really realize it didn't come to me that I wanted to be a veterinarian until I was well into college. And so just one day I woke up and I said, boy, I've been looking for what I really want to do. And it just hit me. And that's what I wanted to do was be a veterinarian. And so then went on and, and finished up my undergrad at, at UNO in Omaha. And then we both ended up at the same school at Kansas State. And, uh, you know, really blessed with a great overall, you know, really all around education that I think is, is something we need to keep pushing more and more. And so my initial love was I wanted to do dairy work. And so I went to Nebraska. There was still a decent amount of dairy there. And I met, I fell into a practice where they were about 60%. Well, lo and behold, I was the guy that replaced the guy that did the pigs. And so they asked me, you know, would you mind doing it? And sure enough, I ended up doing it and realized it was a lot of population medicine similar to what we do in pigs. And it just went off from there. And, you know, then spent, spent uh, 14 years at, uh, at PST Vet Services there in, in Columbus, Nebraska. And, you know, I was covering the Oklahoma stuff when, when you came on. That, that, what, a great, what a great experience to, to ride a lot of farms with you and, and as we were both really growing in our early education and then eventually went out on my own and, and started my own business. So um, that's really kind of my background. Sunai is a professional solution provider for enzymes, probiotics, and functional additives. We offer customized formulas to target nutritional issues in livestock and maximize the utility of animal feed. Find us at sunai.com, spelled S-U-N-H-Y, for more information. Great. Well, it's really fun to reconnect with you and have some of those uh, um, kind of historical stuff, um, knowing each other for a long time and, and really both being, you know, practitioners. So, um, I think the, the topic that, um, we're going to talk, talk about is kind of, uh, you know, what we see out in the field and, and some recent experience that you've had with a newly emerging pathogen that you helped, you know, diagnose and kind of write up the, um, the definition of. So, you know, we've seen, um, these pathogens, you know, PCV2 was probably the first one that I, that I can recall, um, you know, emerging as we were, you know, um, out in the field early in our careers. And then of course, PCV3 and, and staphylovirus that you're going to talk to us about a little bit here and, and sapelovirus. And then, you know, what are these other ones on the radar? So um, I'm excited for, for uh, our discussion and to learn from you, Tom. So tell me about, um, how you discovered sapovirus, um, you know, what was it like in the field? Yeah. So, so it's, it's funny that you go all the way back to PCV2 because I was a denier, you know, I was one, like, I don't know what they're talking about. There's, 
this is, you know, this is something made up. And then here it is. One of the, one of the things that if, if you're going to vaccinate for one thing, it's probably going to be circle virus today. Um, so, so anyway, that was kind of a lesson that I learned. And, and so I quit becoming a denier and opened up my mind a lot and, uh, really just all of a sudden had the opportunity. I was working with a farm that had been stocked clean, no coronaviruses, no PERS viruses. Then we did go through a Delta coronavirus. And coming out of that, we kept seeing a little bit of diarrhea and the testing kept coming back negative. And, and the, and the uh, manager was like, oh, we still have it, we still have it. And we didn't. And so I, I headed down to that, that road where it's, I have, mid to late lactation diarrhea oh that has to be coccidiosis that you know that's just what i was trained and so we went through some different diagnostics did find some coccidiosis so forth and uh implemented a program for it and it would work kind of sometimes and it didn't work sometimes but we just kind of learned to live with this diarrhea that developed. The good news was it wasn't creating a lot of mortality it was just that morbidity of of Wean weights weren't where they were supposed to be. Pens were really messy and so forth. So then we kind of advanced in and said, well, we found some rotavirus. And so we started dealing with that and going through our normal channels of feedback and, and some vaccination and those types of things. But it just never went away. And, and it, would, it would ebb and flow, but mostly it would be flow. <laughs> and so finally, we were actually getting ready for an order uh, of rotavirus vaccine. And the, and the owner of the farm said, I don't think we should order anymore. And I'm like, well, why? I said, and he said, like, because we obviously still have a rotavirus problem. Uh, it must not be working. And so me having the experience in the field of, of, of having seen the program that I had working really well, I'm like, I really have to figure this out. And so it was, it was a really good challenge for me. Um, you know, I've had a lot of opportunities over the years to either get into management uh, or, or, or something of, of a spin off of, of being a veterinarian, but I've always denied it because I just love doing what I do. And I love the health aspect and how it plays into it. So this was a really good peak to my interest. And so I really laid it out and uh, set, up, set everything up so that we had a really good uh, sampling and worked with great diagnosticians. And, and next thing we know, we, we, we have what looks like a rotavirus case, but we don't have any rotavirus. And, and so that, that was right about the time people were starting to use a little bit of next generation sequencing. And I was, I don't know, partly desperate and partly wanting to try it. And, and when we tried it, sure enough, we picked up just an amazing number of reads for sapovirus. And so you know, talking about Sapello virus, I, I thought I just heard him wrong. And he was talking about Sapello virus. And I'm like, but that's a neurologic disease. And he goes, no, Sapo virus. And so that that really became my education point where I had to start learning again. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you had um, an owner, you know, in this case that, you know, really wanted to work with you and, and help you solve this problem. You know, it sounds like um, they were frustrated. And so I think that's important too, you know, that kind of teamwork approach to try to solve a problem. And, you know, a challenge came from, from that owner that, you know, I'm not happy and I don't want to use this vaccine because it doesn't seem like we put that in and maybe it didn't help. Right. So, um, you know, tell me about that and how important that is in your experience. Yeah. Having owners that are bought into not accepting maybe what's common, they don't accept it. It might be a common problem, but it's not a normal problem. And, and sure enough, as I pulled the audience of other uh, other practitioners and so forth, I showed them pictures of what it looked like, and they're like, "Yeah, I see that all the time." And and so having that having that relationship with the owner, and I wouldn't give my clients away for the world. You know, I mean, they're just they're they're great producers. They challenge me all the time, make me better so that I can help make them better, and that that's just a really crucial component of it all. Yeah, it really is. It, it's really, you know, not only do they trust you enough um, to, to um, you know, work with you on making a plan, and but also to challenge, right, keep challenging us in the field that I'm not satisfied, I'm not happy, let's, you know, let's keep working on this. Um, I think that's really important with what we do. And I think what, what makes it rewarding um, in, in the field. That is kind of, you know, we've talked about these emerging diseases, and they so much mimic other diseases. And so we can't just assume all the time 
then it's the same thing. And, and so that's, that's really what sapovirus was. It looked like a classic coccidiosis, looked like a classic rotavirus, but it wasn't. And so we had to look deeper. Yeah. And I think it's, it's great um, seeing these new tools, right? This, you know, whole genome sequencing and um, as a, as a, you know, kind of a new developing tool for us as practitioners. And I used to remind some of the younger veterinarians that worked with me, you know, when I first started, we didn't even have PCR um, and we would go, you know, we, I would challenge them sometimes that, you know, don't, don't just run a PCR just for the sake of running a PCR. Let's make sure you want to, the information that comes from that diagnostic has to, um, you know, has to be an action right from that from that piece of information mm -hmm. and so you know it's interesting now that we're seeing 25 years later even a more um, specific molecular tool that we're going to be able to use so tell me how you use did you use that um you know how did you use that in this case um the the genome sequencing yeah so with the with the next generation part you know the shotgun genomics was we just wanted to find something else is there something else out there? We didn't know if it'd be a, a different strain of rotavirus. You know, there'd been some rotavirus E reported in places. Uh, would it be something else that caused diarrhea and piglets? And, and it worked perfectly. I mean, and, and we found exactly what we were looking for, which was something different that had been described before, but only as a correlation. You know, they'd always found it. When they found it, they would find it with something else. And in this case, it was the only thing there. And so the, the next generation sequencing is, is to me really the perfect tool. And I can't believe how quickly they evolved off of that is how there can be now a next generation sequencing that focuses just on PERS or a next generation sequencing that focuses just on rotavirus to find all the different strains that are there, not just uh, what our, our typical Singer sequence, which finds one and it, and it, and it picks it out. So, so it's amazing how they took that technology very quickly from being a really broad, uh, tell me everything that's in there to tell me everything of a particular organism that's in there. And then of course, now with the ability to hold genome sequence, I would say that's in my hands, that's probably been more with PERS and trying to understand that and, and saying, oh, it's not just about a certain part of the segment of the virus. There's so much more to learn about the history of that virus by looking at the whole genome. Yeah, it's interesting that you brought that up because um, about a year and a half ago, we had, I dipped my toe in, so to speak, at using um, you know the whole genome sequencing on a PERS eradication project and just trying to profile you know as we know PERS changes and within a herd that's vaccinated certainly has um, a lot of change or in my experience had and so you know I did a bit of work trying to use that as a tool to help us understand. Um, during an eradication project with with vaccine, you know, how is that impacting this? And I'm not sure um, I answered a lot of my questions and maybe have more questions now than I did before. Um, but I am excited that down the road, we'll learn better how to interpret those, um, those results, right? That was the biggest problem that I had was, how do, how do I know if this amount of change is um, good or bad, right? Um, in, in watching a PERS eradication project, um, you know, evolve, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I started doing, I think, my first whole genome sequences on PERS back in late 2020. And um, I didn't, I, I got a cute, I was, I was guilty. I was guilty that I didn't really know what I was going to do with that. But I just had this hunch that these were going to be really important. And now that I have kind of a library of them, um, we've been able to do some neat things to show that, hey, this was or wasn't a, a recombination within the farm or, you know, we, where we use some vaccine in the farm. Somebody would say, hey, there's no way we brought a new PERS virus in. Well, when we align them all up on a chart and show the whole genome ORF by ORF, you know, next to each other and nothing triggers to any of the past viruses we've had there. Yeah, we did bring a new virus in. So, so we're already starting to use those tools and I, I'm, I'm very confident if we had the same conversation five years from now, we'll, th that'll just be the standard. Yeah. And I think, I think what you just mentioned, you know, building a library, right? We have, we have this huge library from, you know, just the, um, you know, open reading frame, you know, 
five, seven, three, right? Some, some of those pieces of PERS, right, that we've been and, and know about over the years. But to have the library with the entire genome, is going to take a little bit of time. And then, you know, we have to sort out the story that goes along the, with this, just like you mentioned, the evolution of viruses within a herd um, and, and, you know, recombining. So um, really cool. So go back to um, sapovirus for me and, you know, using the, you know, sort of the deep genome sequencing, you're just looking for kind of a common pathogen, right, in your samples. So then what, then what did you do? So you said, okay, sapovirus is coming up in these, you know, these, I don't know how many samples that you may have run. And, and then what happened? Help me with the progression. Yeah, so, so now for a brief moment in time, I'm probably the only person, it, it was just kind of an eerie feeling. I'm probably the only person that knows those results and has seen the, the clinical signs of it and putting it all together. And so I became very quick to believe that that was really what was going on, but I had to convince other people and, and that really started with the diagnostic lab. And so working with them, um, basically we said, okay, well, can we show something more? And so we went in and we swabbed or 50 litters that I could not see any visible signs of diarrhea. And then amongst those 50 litters where we saw what looked like sapovirus. And, and then we compared the CTs on those. And so the average CT for the, the diarrhea herds was like a, it was somewhere in the mid teens, like 15 or 16. Um, and then on the, on the, on the pigs that didn't have it, I think that the strongest was like a 25 CT, but really they averaged over half those samples were, were negative. And then the rest of them averaged like in the mid thirties. And so when, when that got really put side by side to say, here's affected litters, here's non-affected litters, it really clicked the light bulb on with the diagnostic lab. And then that's when we said, we really have to come up with more information on this. We have to continue to push it. And then we went to Schick and, and, and Schick basically sponsored some more testing. We were able to then uh, create a in situ hybridization where we're able to go down and actually show the pathogen um, in, in a clinical uh, slide of, of atrophic enteritis and show that this, the pathogen sapovirus was right down in the cells that were being affected. And so that really laid the groundwork to say, okay, you know, the, the producer's like, oh, this is great, this is fine, this is dandy, but what do I do about it? Right. And so what did you do about it? How, how did you fix it? Yeah, so we, we, we started off with what was in our memory which was, well, it's an enteric virus. If it was a coronavirus or if it was a rotavirus, we'd feed it back and it would go away. Well, we did that and we didn't get any kind of response. And that's really one that we're still working on is understanding where does, how does the immunity develop and how do the piglets get exposed? And why does what ultimately was our answer was vaccine uh, actually fix that problem? And so, um, we, we could not make a, 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 whole, a whole virus out of it because it's very difficult to grow. And so to, to either A, get it to grow or B, propagate it enough um, was going to be a real challenge. And so we, that's when we went to mRNA technology and, and we said, hey, we, you know, is this possible that we take the gene of interest, the, the section of interest that should create the immunity and put that into a vaccine? And sure enough, it worked really well. Right. Perfect. And so fast forward to today, how is the herd? Uh, herd's doing great. Other than a purse break in between, um, it's doing good. Um, we really feel good about um, the diarrhea. And so what we showed with that, what was really, really interesting was we were guesstimating that our pigs, when we had sapovirus, were, were weighing about anywhere from one to two pounds less at weaning than they should, based off of what we saw at other herds that didn't show the diarrhea. And sure enough, that's exactly what it came out to. And, and so those, that herd went from, uh, we had 21 day old pigs that were sometimes barely hitting 12 pounds, then all of a sudden they're, they're constantly hitting 14 pounds at weaning. So the morbidity that that created uh, was, was really prominent. And today they, yeah, other than a purse break, we're doing really well. Well, wow, that's great. Well, and sorry for the purse. Um, unfortunately, we haven't solved that that disease yet as, as well, it sounds like as you did this apovirus, but, um, 
um, one of these days, right, we'll, we'll have a, a cure for PERS as well. So it sounds like, um, you know, you kind of from start to finish uh, really had to work hard at understanding, is this really a pathogen? How is it affecting the pigs? And then, you know, we're still learning, right, on how this virus might be different than other enteric viruses in its, in its pathogenicity, and then really, you know, what to target in terms of, you know, curing it. Um, so as you were looking at, um, you know, this diarrhea case, what other pathogens, um, you know, were on the horizon or were ones that, you know, we should be thinking about or worried about as you're working with the, the diagnosticians um, in that space? Yeah. Um, so just before Sapovirus, we had jumped into PCV3 and that really, it, it's, it's interesting. Sapovirus jumped to the forefront and was accepted a lot quicker. Still today, PCV3 is not one that people accept, all, you know, all, all across the board. And I think there's some reasons for that with the way that it depends on when the sow is infected. But the ones that I, the one that I'm looking at the hardest, and we may look at possibly doing some field work on that as well, is I really believe there's something real with the Astrovirus 4 and causing it's, it's almost a story just like sapovirus, except it's in the respiratory system. So we have clinical signs that look like things that we are commonly have, like rotavirus and coccidiosis, but it's not those. Well, with, with uh, astrovirus, it, it looks like a, in an influenza break. And, but then when you do your influenza testing and it's negative, then it's like, well, then what the heck is going on? And so, um, you know, some of the researchers at ISU uh, Michael Ray, who's now at North Carolina State, and Rachel Dershide uh, basically went back and looked at, at cases of respiratory disease that, that did not turn out to be influenza and went back and it was amazing how many of those cases uh, had, had astral four in them. And so that really looks like it's probably going to be the next frontier for me uh, as far as what we're looking after. Um, we've done some things with Parvo, uh, Parvo type 2. Uh, and that, that appears to me to have some, some, something real there, probably not to the degree that Astro 4 does. It, it's, it's definitely a co-infection. And so I chase the co-infections as well. I've been really fortunate over the years to deal with a lot of herds that stay PERS negative for a long time, stay coronavirus negative for a long time. They're mycoplasma, how pneumonia naive. And so I play more in that world of co-infections and truly believe in the model that would say PERS is one thing to have, but PERS when there's flu or there's astro or there's parvo two or those types of things going on. Um, I, I really think that that makes it a whole different game. And because the immune system is trying to deal with more than one thing at one time in a pretty prominent manner. So um, I've been a little bit heavy on what most people would probably budget for a vaccination protocol for sows. But I believe if we control it in the sows, we'll be a lot better off. And I think that's ultimately where Astro 4 will go. But, but that one's the one that's on my radar the most right now. So you mentioned, you know, uh, respiratory disease and, you know, ruling out influenza. I had a case where um, I, I could have swore it was influenza and it turned out to be mycoplasma hyalurinus. Um, and so that was, you know, something that opened my eyes a little bit to, you know, don't, don't just assume when you have a, you know, upper respiratory um, and a lot of, you know, uh, nasal discharge and coughing, et cetera, that it's, you know, oh, that's flu. Um, I was very humbled in that experience. And so when you talked about astrovirus, it reminded me of that. And I didn't do anything further, right? We, I kind of went to the hyalurinus and, and looked to target that as my pathogen, but perhaps there was astrovirus or, or still could be there. So I didn't do the, I didn't do, you know, deep genome sequencing. Right, right. And I think there's some stuff on the horizon here, if it's not here already. I know up at the University of Minnesota, they're working on um, a very broad spectrum PCR, somewhat like uh, next generation sequencing. But then there's a company out of Europe that uh, I, I need to touch base with. They, they have it called Pathosense, which is, again, looking at a broad spectrum array of, of what all is here. Um, now that might scare us because I had an influenza break where uh, we were actually trying to do an eradication and we did our first round of vaccine and things just were not getting better. So we really spent a lot of time working with industry to figure that out. And one thing is we found there was another influenza there. 
but in the same process, there's, there's a lot of things that make piglets cough on the viral side, not to mention what you said with the bacterial side or the mycoplasmal side, you know, parasuis will cause a lot of sneezing and cause a lot of coughing too. But, but here in the same pigs, we're able to find influenza in more than one strain. We're able to easily find Astro 4. We're able to find PHEV. And we are also able to find um, parainfluenza para virus. So, you know, that whole thing and why are these things emerging is kind of the big question. Have they been here all along? Probably. I don't think that they're evolving into something new. They may be developing things, but I think the thing we have to remember, and this has been a hard lesson for me, is everything we do when we try to cure these pigs with either antibiotics or vaccines is we're trying to kill and, and or prevent a, a growth. And, and so it's really taken me back to, you know, maybe, maybe a lot of this microbiome thing and these, and letting microorganisms work with each other rather than against each other. We're, we're moving the evolutionary needle very hard and the selection needle very hard with viruses because of our intensity with vaccine. And so when we vaccinate for something, we open a door for something else is what I think is probably happening. We have to prove that, but, but remember the viruses don't, they don't have a brain. They don't decide and sit in the corner and say, Hey, how should we change so that we can infect pigs? What they basically do is they respond to the pressures we put on them. Yeah. And I think you're exactly right. If you think about another way to kind of challenge the immune system is bringing in, you know, um, a guilt perhaps that hasn't seen some of the pathogens that the, the sow herd has, right? And, you know, when we were working with a lot of PERS and doing a lot of, you know, herd closures and eradications or new sourcing, um, what I've seen is we, we sometimes cannot prepare the guilt like we would in a normal situation to, you know, have a good robust immune system because we're trying to keep them free from PERS. And so they're raised separate from the farm and they come in as a completely new source and we breed them as matures and they come in and then you, we, you know, I, I had some experience, I found some of these pathogens that are normally well controlled, mycoplasma hyorhinus or Haemophilus parasuus or you name it. Um, and that's when we start to see a clinical and a sow herd and then to the nursery passed on. And so, how do we prepare that that immune system in those situations for these pathogens that I think perhaps are are kind of endemic or low lying, and there's some immunity that you know that happens early on, and you just don't see them you know clinically express themselves until there's a PERS break or or another pathogen that that um, you know challenges the immune system. What do you think about gilts? Can they be the cause? Yeah, I, the, the guilt is a big thing. And, and as we know, what, what, it was Camille Moore, you know, how many decades ago that really showed us that parity segregation really made a difference. And, and there's a lot of truth to that. And, and so getting that accomplished is a whole nother task. Um, but, but there's something to be learned there. And then, then now you layer on top of that, Tara, what about when we change guilt sources? even if they are PERS negative and they are myco negative and they are, maybe they're, we're lucky and they're flu negative. What about all the other stuff? And, and so we just, eventually it seems like right at first it may go fine, but then next thing you know, I got a little rotavirus going again. Oh, that's a strain I haven't seen before. Oh, I got strep going on again. And so it's all those other things that come along because each farm kind of creates its own ecological, uh, yeah, its own ecology, right? And so by having that ecology, and then all of a sudden I'm going to bring, you know, an example of something from somewhere else, I'm going to drop it in there, then we're going to disturb, we're going to create competition, we're going to create some synergies. And and so the disease complex is just going to completely change. Yeah, I agree. And I, I've definitely seen it happen in the field. And it'll be it'll be interesting to see, you know, technology advance maybe in, in kind of the probiotic area of trying to you know, get the pig ready, <clears throat> but in a different way, right? Because, you know, we can't, we can't necessarily raise them alongside the herd mates that we're going to put them into the herd when we're trying to eradicate a pathogen. Um, so that's the challenge. So I, I think kind of a, a probiotic or, or getting the immune system ready for a challenge like that or more robust is, is, a, is a great area that we can explore. 
Yeah, I think you're right on. Um, you know, not just the probiotic, but the prebiotic and the postbiotic and people start to get their head starts to spin talking about it all. But I really think that that what we really need to look at hard and, and I'm not insinuating that we all of a sudden put pigs back out on dirt, that we let them run the prairies and all that. There's going to be people that find that niche. But at the same time, is there pieces of that that we can bring back to our modern pig production and let the let the immune system and not just not just what our our own cells do, but what our microbiome can do. And the prebiotic in my in my mind is if we can find ways to feed the bacteria, because if I come in with a probiotic and then I take it away, I eventually go back to my own old microflora. The the, the probiotic I think fits a nice role to fit a fit a middle and in, in in, you know to to maybe almost act as a treatment. But if we can get to finding the right substrates to feed our pigs that maybe not, maybe don't feed the pig, but feed the, the gut bacteria. And then, you know, I, I, I was at a meeting last week and, and I've been really fortunate not to have these ghastly E. coli breaks that kill pigs like crazy. And, and I think we really need to look back to something simple like the mucin layer and, and, you know, the old leaky gut syndrome and, and what things can we do to help our pigs Granted, there's going to be some cost. Maybe there could be a loss of performance. I don't know. But what's what's the gain if, if I have a good gut barrier that filters out those those evil pathogens uh, and manages them within their own ecology? Yeah, the leaky gut syndrome, you know, that reminds me really, geez, 10, 15 years ago, right, when Dr. Adam Moser was doing a lot of that work on, you know, helping us understand really just wean age, right, and the, and the challenges that we sort of brought to our own industry with early weaning um, and have kind of come back full circle and understand, you know, that so much better. But um, yeah, I think, I think that's really interesting, you know, how do we prepare the pig um, you know, for its early nursery challenges, right, with that really stressful weaning event, all the way to, you know, a young pig that's, that's um, you know, got a new diarrhea disease that, um, you know, what's going on here, right? What are some tools that are not, maybe not necessarily an antibiotic, but a different way to be thinking about prevention and, and you know, cure that, that's, not, that's not necessarily just, a, just an antibiotic for the bug? Yeah, we've paid so much attention to our adaptive immune system, and we've really forgotten about our innate immune system. And that's really the the, the gut is the gut barrier is just one of those. Our skin barrier, all those things come into play. You know, we really we create some. I, you think you could make the argument we keep our pigs too clean, and and then we we do that, and then we don't build a good innate immunity. Um, but then obviously there's, there's cost to performance if we let them get exposed. So yeah, we're going to have to learn something because we can, we can only vaccinate for so many things and we can only accept so much for, for mortality in our industry um, without really having a black eye. And so we're going to have to look back and we're going to have to think outside the box and there's going to be some gives and takes, but I think really looking at that innate immunity is going to, going to help really help rebalance this thing. Couldn't agree more. Well, so lots of areas to further study, right? And so that segues for me into another topic that I want to chat with you about. Um, and that's that I know you recently um, accomplished getting your master's degree. And so congratulations on that, Tom. And so tell me at this point in your career, you know, you and I are are similar in how long we've been, you know, out of vet school and, and paving our way, so to speak. What are the benefits of doing that now, as, as you're 20 years out of, you know, out of school, tell me how you decided to do that or why. Yeah. So, and, and by the way, I probably won't have my master's till December, but I'm working on it. So. Ah, perfect. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm not quite there yet, but, but I really started looking back and in this industry, it's very easily just to kind of get on a current and just ride that current and not change. And I started reflecting. I think that's something we all need to spend that time to do is to reflect on who we are, what we were maybe before what we were today and what made us that way. And what I realized is I'd really, I'd start, I'd, I'd quit learning for learning's sake. And, and instead I would only learn what I felt like I had to know. And, and so I really challenged myself from a learning standpoint. And the one big area that, that changed before I decided to go to school again 
was reading books. And, and I'm, and I used to, I used to be the most avid reader when I was a kid and I'd really let that go other than to read a journal article here or there. And that was about it. Most of my learning was coming through, which is an important route is through communications with my peers. But, but sometimes you have to dig into things that you, that you do, that you don't really know. Um, I'm, I've also challenged, and I'm not just talking about in the pig world and the health world, but whether it's religion or philosophy or whatever, um, and I, I've made, made it where I listen to things that I go into knowing that I don't agree with. Um, and then it either changes me or it reinforces where I am. But regardless, there's really nobody in the world that you can't learn something new from. And, and reading it in a book is a good way for me to absorb that. But then what I, what I actually ended up doing, and part of that was maybe with SAPO starting to work with the diagnostic lab. And then I started getting to know a few of the grad students at Iowa State. And I knew some from Minnesota um, and I was just really, it's, it's almost that infectious learning, you know, naivety to what you're doing and wanting to know more. And they were just so energized and they were so fun to be around and the questions they'd ask. And, and I was sitting at, uh, in Chicago, um, at the, at the, uh, PER symposium across the table from Daryl Holtkamp at ISU. And I just told him, I said, man, it makes me want to go back to school. And he just very blankly looked at me and said, well, then why don't you? And I'm like, well, I can, I got to keep working. And then really, you know, started finding out that, you know, COVID probably did us one favor is it made us very much um, where we can do things online. And so he basically showed me uh, and then talking to the program uh, directors is, yeah, you can do this without, you know, you're still going to have to spend a lot of time. As you know, getting your master's, you have to, I mean, it's, it's not just an hour a week. It's, it's, it's several hours a week that you have to block away from what you normally do. But then as I've gotten into it, it's, it's, the, it's one of the smartest things I ever did. Um, the best advice I'd ever gotten was from Daryl to say, just, well, then why don't you? Um, it's taken me back and, and made me see, boy, I've made some big decisions off of a very little amount of data. And sometimes we have to do that. That's just the times and what, what's going on. But at the same time, it's, it's just really rounding me and making me a better thinker. And it, being a better thinker makes me a better veterinarian. Like I said before, that's what I love to do. And that's going to make me better for my clients. Tom, you know, in, in your answer, you reminded me that, um, you know, I also agree that you can kind of get I guess a little bit of, you know, tunnel vision or you're, you're really kind of moving from one emergency to the next one, right? And you're reading and learning only on necessity to solve this current thing that you're being challenged with. And, and then the next day or the next week, you've got another one, maybe the same disease, different herd, right? Or, or maybe a different disease, um, you know, same herd, but whatever. It's really, you know, learning just by necessity and not really learning because that's what we enjoy and we and that's what really makes you know makes us thrive and and have a passion back for for um, you know just continuous learning. So I can appreciate you know that story when I you know the I don't know if you're familiar with a strengths finder, but for me, you know, learner is my top, and I found myself not really doing that anymore. And so I uh, lost, lost a bit of my drive and passion because I just didn't have time for it. Didn't seem like I was learning new things and seeing things in a different perspective. So um, I think that's a really great, great story. And, and so for, you know, advice maybe from you to our listeners, you know, whether it's veterinarians, <clears throat> excuse me, that are, you know, 10 years out or whether it's production managers or CEOs or, you know, whatever business you're in, if you find yourself, you know, not, you know, not progressing, not being challenged, um, maybe you need to look within a little bit. What do you think? Yeah. And I think for each person, it's going to be different. Um, you and I chose to get a master's degree. But some people, they, I mean, that's not saying that's what you have to do. Um, the one challenge I would tell people is read. And, and I'm, I'm terrible at remembering names a lot of times, but there's a, a recent uh, military person that had a quote that basically, I'll paraphrase, was that if you're not reading hundreds of books, then you're no better than if you couldn't read at all because we're wasting that opportunity to get into other people's minds with something that they took their heart and soul and put into a book. And you may not agree with it, 
but it'll, it'll make you a better person and, and a better thinker. And so, you know, I think that's where I would start now. Uh, I read a lot now because of my travel. I read on the on Audible, you know, or, 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 or some other platform, a podcast or whatever. You know, these podcasts that you guys are doing are, are phenomenal to help keep people up to date. And then you can always dig deeper. But, but I think if we're, so I believe that, that our clients deserve the best out of us. And if we're not getting better every day, then we're actually falling behind. And it, you know, I, I think back five years ago, I didn't talk about prebiotics and postbiotics and, and, and different things like that. And, you know, I, I probably, I, 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 it just is making me more well-rounded that I can at least offer that up. And, and start to filter through what really does make sense in my mind or not. So it's not, it, it, to me, I'd say just start, start somewhere and then let, you know, God or who, whatever drives you, it, you, it'll lead you to whatever it is that, that you're meant to do. In my case, it, it was, hey, go get your master's or get some more education. Yeah, don't, don't forget yourself and what makes you happy or, you know, makes you uh, continue to grow as a person, right? Whatever that may be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, we're kind of rounding our time together, Tom. And, and it's funny that you mentioned, you know, you're um, kind of getting back into reading and challenging yourself with um, with reading again, as you used to do. Um, there's um, before we go into kind of our three questions that we ask all of our um, guests, which is, you know, somewhat about the books or resources they're using. Do you have any last closing comments that you want to share or, or challenge our um our listeners with as, as we, you know, talked about just kind of the emergence of a new pathogen in your quest to, to find answers and, and, you know, then into, you know, um, what do you want to challenge us with? Yeah. So my challenge would be is, um, that don't think you can do it all yourself. Uh, that's always been a tough one for me because I've always wanted to just have the answers. Well, to get those answers, you have to collaborate, you know, and people probably sometimes maybe get sick of hearing me say that word is to collaborate, but we really have to, to, to do the right thing for the animals that we care for. That's what, that's what our passion is, as veterinarians is to take care of animals. Now they happen to all have owners and, and, and caretakers and so forth. And that's a whole nother piece that we have to, we have to serve them as well. But, but, but to do that, we have to think multidisciplinary and we have to think of, of meeting people and reaching out. I, I, I always worry that social media has made us less social. Um, you know, even though it's in the, it's in the word, um, we're human beings and we need the human, we need the human bond. Um, we are part of an animal kingdom, but we are something special within that kingdom. And sometimes we're not very proud of that, but we really need to be, but, but it's really about sharing. It's about making each other better and then, you know, giving and then you get back from that. Not expecting anything back, but but invariably, if you're a giver and you're out there helping and you're trying to solve problems, whether they're yours or they're somebody else's, you're going to get back in, in, you know, logarithmic amounts more than what you put in. Oh, I think that's that's great advice. And absolutely, as we, you know, talked through the path and, and you know, you solving a problem, you started with the owner producer, right, challenging you and then working with the diagnostic labs and understanding together, is this a pathogen and what does it do? And then bringing Schick on board and trying to understand even further, you know, diving deeper um, to then sharing your, you know, your findings in, you know, in a journal and and sharing at Lehman conference and ASB, right? That's, that's part of it. So that collaboration is really, really important. I couldn't agree more. It's time for our famous three. Explore Meta Farms for all your livestock production data needs. Experience our integrated software platform offering complete operational visibility from breed to market. Utilize customizable dashboards for data analysis and benchmarking. Meta Farms mobile apps enable offline access, maximizing efficiency and enhancing profitability. Visit us today at Meta Farms. So before we get to the three questions, um, if anybody has uh, comments or questions for Dr. Tom Petznik, um, please uh, ask those on the channel and have a chat. Also, thanks for the comments on the podcast. Give us a thumbs up if you like um, 
what we're doing here at SwineIt. And so now the three questions. So the first one, what is your favorite book or resource that you use in your area of expertise? So I know we learned that you're a reader, Tom, and you've, you know, come back to challenging yourself with doing more of that. But um, give us your favorite or the go-to if you if you had one in the area of, of swine medicine or epidemiology or pathology, what is it? You know, and, and this, I don't know if this is a cop-out or not, but um, one thing I would encourage, because this is one of my best sources of new knowledge, is even if you don't go to graduate school, even if you don't, um, you know, want to do a continuing education, at least reach out to grad schools because they always need projects. And what's really fun about those projects is that you get to be on the cutting edge of whatever's going on. I mean, you have to, you, you learn it and, and the process and, and very quickly can determine you're on the cutting edge. Um, and then I think the, the, the other piece of that is volunteer um, because, you know, I'll sit and listen to research proposals, whether it's for um, uh, something with through AASB or through SHIC or whatever. And so you're always learning. And so you're, you're like, wow, I wasn't even thinking about that. And so that's a really great resource because it also connects you with people that are connected. And, and so that, that, that is, now, as far as a book or anything like that, um, I get exposed to journal articles. I think it's easy to say, well, let's go read diseases of swine or let's read J Shap or let's read something like that, but then go into the reference list. And, and then when you see something that you're interested in, go into the reference list and or get onto PubMed and, and do the hard work like you would uh, to, to reach that out and find those articles. It's amazing how many of those are free access. And so there's just lots of good information that we learned to do in vet school that is probably really a lost kind of art is to take and critically read journal articles. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And you know, if you want the if you want the full journal article and it's not accessible, if you are working on something with a grad student, you can usually get it from them, right? So a little a little trick that I've done as well is, you know, let's work together and you know, what are you how are you digging into this topic, right? And 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 I've been shared a lot of, you know, really good resources that way. So what about something beyond, you know, vet med, um, you know, maybe something fun or a challenge or, or something else as a resource. And I love that you brought up a resource and not just a book, because that's, that's part of this too. It, you know, it doesn't have to be a book. It could be a way to stay connected. And I, and I love the thought about, you know, being on a, on a you know, committee with graduate students or connected with, you know, with a vet, with a school that, that has really young, you know, students really seeking to learn. Yeah. Yeah. So outside of that, like I said, I've been reading a lot more than ever. A lot of that listening to audio books, um, the one that one of them and, and I'll kind of really I'll really range it. I'll be into evolutionary biology for a couple months and then I might go into philosophy for a couple months. And then I finally just need a break. And so I just I just hit a break where I just need I need to just kind of more of a fun book. Um, and, and so probably the one that, uh, the more ph philosophical book that I just finished was actually written in the seventies. It was by, uh, uh, psychologist Eric Fromm and, and he wrote, it's called to have or to be. And it, you, when you read that book, you're going to think he wrote it in 2024 about our society and how we've become a having, I got to have this and I got to have that, um, rather than just being and being a human being to each other. You know, somebody said that the other day is, is, um, you know, human being a, hu a human being is being human. And, and so that's one that we have to continue to work on. But then my fun book that I'm reading right now is it was, again, kind of looking back what I used to do. And I used to read a lot of James Michener. Um, he'll take um, he'll take a historical uh, region like Mexico or Hawaii or Chesapeake Bay area or whatever. And then he'll tell actual stories with fictional characters that stay within the code of the history that's behind that. And so, um, as I've reached back a little bit into my roots, uh, we've got some in Poland. And so I got to look and I said, I need to read more on Poland. Well, sure enough, he wrote a book called Poland, uh, by James Michener. So it's going to take me a while. It's about a 30 hour lesson, but, uh, I was just, I just really filled myself with a lot of academic stuff and it was time to, 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 to do something a little different. 
Yeah, I understand that. And, and having a, a broad genre is kind of fun, right? It keeps you, uh, keeps you thinking on different levels. So very cool. So one last question for you, Tom. So um, we get your perspective um, is share with me an attribute or characteristic that you feel sets successful people apart from others. Yeah, the, the one that I admire the most is people that are truly kind. Like they really, they, they exude a kindness um, to pretty much everyone. They don't necessarily agree with what everybody is or does or, or how their life is, but they treat them, um, they, they treat them like a human being. Again, I, I don't mean to keep going back to that, but I think that's really important for us to, that's, that's part of the hard part. We just say, oh, I want to work by myself and I want to do this, whatever. But, but bottom line is treating people with kindness and respect um, you know, if, if without getting all silly with it, I mean, it's love for, for, for each other, um, and wanting what's best for each other. And so the kind people are the ones that stick out to me that they, they never have a bad word to say to somebody, um, in person or, or away from them. And I think if we could have a lot more people like that, um, we'd all respect each other a lot more. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I, I agree with that. And I have, a, you know, a, a young daughter in college. And so I can appreciate, um, you know, she, she talks about, you know, just being kind and trying to, trying to fit in. So, so important, so important. Well, thank you so much for um, being my guest and reconnecting. It was so fun to visit with you. It's been a little while. Um, so I, I appreciate your time and I, and I hope you um, we were able to share with our listeners, you know, some of what you've been working on and, and uh, really, really thankful you could join me. Well, I'm glad. Again, I, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to talk about the things I've done, uh, the things that I believe it doesn't make them right or wrong, but um, that's the interaction that I'm looking for. And I appreciate and from no one better than from you, um, just because of our long history. Um, and, and so I really appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Thanks again.